In this lesson, we're going to go over the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of criminal procedure on the bar exam in 60 minutes or less, or in other words, we're going to go over the absolute must know stuff in criminal procedure for the bar exam, which historically, if we look at the data, is going to be fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment violations, and what the effects of those violations are under the exclusionary rule and fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. Typically, these are the areas in criminal procedure where we're going to have the most opportunities to collect points on the bar exam. So these are the areas I'm really going to try to break down as best as I possibly can over the next hour or so. But with that, I can just go ahead and set the timer over here to one hour. Ready, set, go. So our clock has officially started. We can just jump right into criminal procedure. So in this lesson, we're really going to focus on fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment violations and what the effects of those violations are, right? But in short, kind of as our starting point rule, we can just say, hey, look, if the government infringes on a person's fourth, fifth, or sixth amendment rights, then most of the time, any evidence obtained in violation of those rights or as a result of those violations is generally inadmissible, right? This is the exclusionary rule and fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, right? We'll see if the government has infringed on a criminal defendant's fourth, fifth, or sixth amendment rights, then generally, as our starting point rule, that evidence obtained in violation of those rights is inadmissible, right? Unless an exception applies. And as we work through these amendments and kind of what the analyses look like, we'll talk about these exceptions and how it all fits together. And I think at the end, we can kind of review it big picture and it should all hopefully make sense how this kind of fits together. But with that, we can just jump right into the Fourth Amendment, right? The Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable government searches and seizures. Of course, we break this up into two major categories, right? We have evidentiary searches and seizures and seizures of a person, right? Evidentiary searches and seizures, the government's going out and trying to obtain evidence to use against a person in a criminal proceeding, right? This would be like going out to get guns, weapons, the murder weapon, drug paraphernalia, documents, right? They're going out and trying to obtain objects to use against somebody in a criminal proceeding. But also under the Fourth Amendment, we have to think about government seizures of a person, right? This is any time on a bar exam fact pattern you see a government official restricting a person's movement, right? It could be very brief, very temporary, and it can go all the way up to putting handcuffs on someone, putting them in the back of a squad car, taking them down to the police station, right? All of these different types of fact patterns we wanna think about, well, is the government actually seizing a person, right? Because if we have a government seizure of a person, that raises some Fourth Amendment issues, right? We'll see that the government can't just seize people for no reason, right? They're going to have to have some basic basis for doing that. And that's really what your Fourth Amendment seizure of a person analysis comes down to. But question number one has to be, did the government seize a person, right? And the way you make this determination is by asking whether a reasonable person under the totality of the circumstances would have felt free to terminate the encounter with this government agent or this government official, right? If a reasonable person and under the totality of the circumstances would have felt free to terminate the encounter, then we don't have a government seizure of a person for Fourth Amendment purposes, right? Imagine that you're just walking down the street and a police officer comes up to you and asks you how your day is going. He's like, hey, how's your day going? Right At that point, right, a reasonable person would understand that they're free to terminate the encounter. Right, A police officer asking you how your day is going, right, a reasonable person understands, oh, I can just say, ah, good or whatever, and walk away. Right, A reasonable person understands in that situation, they would be free to terminate the encounter. So that example is not a government seizure of a person. right? So the question is, okay, well, at what level is that movement going to be restricted enough that we actually do have a government seizure of a person, right? Probably the most basic that almost anyone can relate to is being pulled over for a traffic stop, right? If you've ever been pulled over by a police officer, right, then you've been seized by the government, right? Because when the police officer comes up behind you and turns on the lights, 
right, uh, their squad car, a reasonable person understands that they're not free to terminate the encounter, right? We understand in the United States, definitely, when a police officer comes behind you and turns on the lights, that you really have to pull over. You got to stop what you're doing. You got to pull over and see what the police officer wants, right? If you fail to do this, it's usually going to not end well for you, right? So if you've ever been pulled over, right, this would be kind of a classic vehicular stop right, is a classic government seizure, right? You, a reasonable person would not feel free to terminate the encounter when a police officer comes behind him and turns on the lights, right? But any kind of substantial stop, right, where we're getting to, right, and really for our purposes on the bar exam, though, without going too deep into it, right, we have two types of seizures we really want to keep in mind, right? We have the Terry stop, and the arrest, right? Terry stop refers to the case Terry v. Ohio, right? And basically a Terry stop is just a temporary seizure to investigate suspected criminal activity, right? So it has to be based on a reasonable suspicion, right? In order to conduct a Terry stop, the law enforcement officer, the government agent, has to have a reasonable suspicion based on articulable facts that criminal activity is afoot. Either this person is engaged in criminal activity or they're about to be engaged in criminal activity, right? In the landmark case, Terry v. Ohio, what you had was a couple of suspects outside a shop window. They kind of kept looking into the shop window, then they'd like walk away, and then they'd come back and like look in the shop window, then they'd walk away. Right, the police officer in that case believed that they looked like they were casing the joint, right, to potentially burglarize it. Right, so in that case, that was his reasonable suspicion. Of course, yeah, that's a reasonable suspicion. In that case, you could go up and stop somebody temporarily to investigate whether criminal activity is afoot. Right, so the way a Terry stop works is once an officer has a reasonable suspicion, very important to recognize a reasonable suspicion cannot just be a hunch or an intuition, right? It has to be a suspicion based on articulable facts, right? Like it looks like these defendants are casing the joint, right? The cop has to be able to, or the government agent has to be able to point to actual facts and say, this is why I had my suspicion. It can't just be, oh, my officer instinct or my hunch, my intuition. That's not enough for a reasonable suspicion. It has to be based on articulable facts, right? But once the officer or the government agent does have that reasonable suspicion and they want to stop somebody to investigate whether criminal activity is afoot, right? The way that ter the Terry stop works is the police officer has to take diligent steps to either confirm or dispel his suspicion, right? You can't just hold somebody, the government can't hold someone in perpetuity, you know, and just make them wait there. They have to be diligent, they have to take diligent steps to either confirm or dispel their suspicion. And if their suspicion is dispelled, right, they investigate and they're like, oh, you know, it looks like there's actually not a criminal activity afoot here, right? Then they have to end the seizure. They have to let that person go. However, on the other hand, if they're investigating during this Terry stop and they're like, hey, you know, that can rise to the level. If they discover some facts, they see some stuff, that can rise to the level of probable cause and turn into an actual arrest, right? To arrest somebody, to take them into custody, right? An arrest is a much more substantial form of a government seizure, right? Not only is the person not, would a reasonable person not feel free to terminate the encounter, right? That's the baseline requirement for a government seizure of a person. An arrest, we'd say it's even beyond that. It's a more substantial restriction of movement, right? Typically, we associate this with putting handcuffs on someone, putting them in the back of the squad car, taking them down to the station for booking and either an interrogation or an indictment to begin the charging process, right? That's what we associate with an arrest. It's a more substantial form of seizure than a Terry stop. A Terry stop is a temporary stop to investigate whether criminal activity is afoot or not, right? It has to happen at a really diligent, quick pace. An arrest, right, is once we actually have probable cause, right? The requirement to take someone into custody and arrest them is probable cause, which is a much higher form of certainty than reasonable suspicion would be, right? Typically with probable cause,
you're thinking things like the police officer has actually directly witnessed some sort of criminal activity or a witness has told him there's criminal activity going on. Those are the types of things that rise to probable cause and when that arrest can happen. Right, so important to recognize that a Terry stop can evolve into an arrest, right? An officer has reasonable suspicion, right? They stop somebody, they do their investigation, right? They're taking diligent steps during their investigation. They learn facts, right? That can rise now to probable cause and they can actually make that lawful arrest, right? Take the person into custody and begin the either interrogation or formal charging process, right? But that's kind of government seizure of a person. Last thing you'd wanna note with an arrest is Typically, you don't need an arrest warrant, right? The government doesn't need a warrant to arrest somebody. Really, the only time they need a warrant to arrest somebody is if they're conducting the arrest inside the defendant's home, right? Inside the defendant's home, then typically they would need an arrest warrant. Otherwise, probable cause by itself is sufficient, right? A police officer who has probable cause doesn't have to go and get a warrant from a judge to arrest somebody, right? He can witness a crime occurring and in the moment without getting a warrant, arrest that person, right? Lawfully, if he has probable cause, right? So that's Fourth Amendment seizures of a person, right? Fourth Amendment seizures of evidence, right? Is a little bit different. Evidentiary searches and seizures of evidence for Fourth Amendment purposes. Our starting point rule is that if the government is going to physically intrude, right? They're going to physically intrude into a constitutionally protected area to search and seize evidence, right? We'll see that the starting point rule is that they actually do need a valid search warrant. So absent an exception, a Fourth Amendment search performed by the government without a warrant is unlawful right? So the starting point rule is different for evidentiary searches and seizures. Evidentiary searches and seizures, our starting point rule is to conduct a Fourth Amendment search, right? To physically intrude into a constitutionally protected area, government has to have a search warrant unless an exception applies. To arrest somebody, right? To seize a person, even to arrest somebody, they don't need a warrant, right? It's just probable cause, right? One distinction we want to be aware of. But really, evidentiary searches and seizures is kind of a four-step analysis. Number one, we always want to make sure that we have a government actor involved in the fact pattern. Classically, you'll see on the bar exam an employer, right? An employer-employee relationship where you have an employer like rummaging through an employee's stuff, like maybe he's going through an employee's backpack and he finds drugs, right? And the question is, well, is that a Fourth Amendment violation, right? Is that an unreasonable search and seizure of evidence under the Fourth Amendment? And the answer is no, right? Fourth Amendment's not an issue if we don't have a government agent, right? An employer searching through an employee's backpack doesn't raise any Fourth Amendment issues, right? We have to have a government agent violating the defendant's reasonable expectation of privacy. We have to have a government agent performing the search in order to raise Fourth Amendment issues. Right, which takes us to our second question, right? Number two, we have to define what a search actually is under the Fourth Amendment, right? When we talk about a search and seizure of evidence for Fourth Amendment purposes, we're not using the word search like a layman person might use the word search, right? Someone might say, oh, I wake up in the morning and I search for my car keys, right? That's not what we're talking about when we say the word search for Fourth Amendment purposes, right? That might be the dictionary definition of search, but what we mean when we're talking about a search in terms of the Fourth Amendment is the government actually physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area. A constitutionally protected area is going to be a place where the defendant has a reasonable expectation of privacy. So our second step in the analysis has to be, okay, number one, we have a government agent. Number two, is the government agent physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area? Is this government agent violating the defendant's reasonable expectation of privacy? Right, and our starting point rule is kind of anything that is visible from public space, right? Imagine that a police officer is standing on the sidewalk, right? A public sidewalk or a public street and is just looking around, right? Even with like a flashlight or whatever, is looking around. 
right? If the police officer is doing this, that's not a Fourth Amendment search. A police officer walking down the sidewalk, a public street, a public sidewalk, looking around, he's not violating anyone's reasonable expectation of privacy. Anything that's visible from public space, public airspace, public space, public sidewalks, right? does not violate a person's reasonable expectation of privacy. So that's not a search for Fourth Amendment purposes. right? What we're really looking for here is the government physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area. right? And the big ones on the bar exam we want to be aware of where we would say, okay, you do have a reasonable expectation of privacy in these places. If the government's gonna physically intrude into any of these places, they need a search warrant to do that, or we need an exception, right? That's going to be the home, right? Which includes the curtilage surrounding the home, basically like the backyard, right? Hotel rooms, offices, and luggage. Those are the big four on the bar exam that we see commonly tested, right? A person's home, they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. You have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your home. This includes the backyard, right? So long as the backyard's not visible from a public space, right? The home, the curtilage surrounding the home, right? An office, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your office. You have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a hotel room, right? You have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your luggage, backpack, right? Luggage, suitcase, right? These are the areas that are commonly tested where we would say the defendant has a reasonable expectation of privacy. So in order for the government to physically intrude into any of those areas, they need a valid search warrant or an exception to the search warrant requirement. Otherwise, it's unlawful. Another area that's really tested here is the open fields doctrine, right? We say that a defendant, a person does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in open fields, right? Even if the open field is on private property, even if there's a fence surrounding the open field, right? So classically, right, in open fields are just like wide open spaces, right? Think about farmland, right? Plains, rolling hills, you know, wooded areas, forestry, park type areas, right? All of these wide open spaces are open fields. And we say that people don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in an open field, right? So even if that private, even if that open field though is on a private area, private property surrounded by like a barbed wire fence, right? A police officer can come up to the barbed wire fence with his flashlight, right? Step over the barbed wire fence and start looking around in that open field. And that's not a Fourth Amendment search, right? He's not violating anyone's reasonable expectation of privacy. It's an open field. There is no reasonable expectation of privacy in open fields, right? So the big ones we want to look out for are anything that's visible from public spaces, right? Remember, anything that's visible from a public space is not violating someone's reasonable expectation of privacy. So if a police officer is just walking down the street, public parks, right? Anything that's open to the public, anything that's visible from a public space, they're not violating anyone's reasonable expectation of privacy. If they're coming onto an open field, even if that open field is privately owned, even if they're stepping over a fence, right? Open fields, there's no physical intrusion into a constitutionally protected area because there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in an open field, right? That's the open fields doctrine, right? But otherwise, right, if you have a hotel, a home, including the curtilage, the backyard of the home, right, luggage and offices, we really wanna think about in order for the government to physically intrude into those areas, generally they need a valid search warrant to do so or an exception to apply. Otherwise, we would say those searches are unlawful. Okay, so next we'd move on to question number three. Well, does the government agent have a search warrant, right? If we see a government agent physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area, right? We have a government agent going into a person's home, right? He's opening the door and he's coming into someone's house with a flashlight looking around, right? Okay, so we definitely have a government agent. We have a police officer and he's definitely physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area. He's coming into someone's home. The next question has to be, well, does he have a valid search warrant to do this? Well, number one, does he have a search warrant, right? The fact pattern will have to tell you whether or not he has a search warrant. If he has a search warrant, is the search warrant valid? We'll see that there's three requirements to have a valid search warrant, right? To be valid, 
A search warrant must be issued by a neutral magistrate. It has to be based on probable cause and it has to describe the place to be searched with particularity, right? So number one, it has to be issued by a neutral magistrate, right? So if you see like the attorney general trying to issue a search warrant, that's not valid, right? It has to be issued by a neutral magistrate. Number two, it has to be based on probable cause, right? So that judge, in order to issue a search warrant, is going to need some facts presented to him or to her that show that there is a strong chance that the evidence is going to be in this location, right? A search warrant can't just be based on a whim or a reasonable suspicion, right? It has to be based on probable cause. You're going to need credible facts that show, hey, look, this evidence, it's a very strong likelihood it's in this constitutionally protected area. We need a search warrant to go and obtain it, right? So the police usually are going to have to show to the judge that they have credible witnesses or an informant or some really good reason to believe that the evidence is in this constitutionally protected area. Third, we want to make sure that the search warrant describes the place to be searched with particularity, right? It has to describe the items to be searched for with particularity and the actual areas to be searched with particularity. So you want to look for search warrants that are very broad, right? Very vague and broad search warrants are typically going to be invalid, right? If a judge issues a search warrant that says, you can search this guy's home or office for anything that could potentially be illegal, right? Well, that's way too broad, right? We got to narrow that down, right? We have to identify the exact property that's being searched and we have to identify what objects the police can actually look for when they're conducting the search warrant, right? So. You want to look out for really broad search warrants generally are going to be considered invalid. So one exception here though that we want to look out for in terms of our exclusionary rule is that evidence recovered from an invalid search warrant will not be excluded if the search warrant is facially valid and the police in good faith believed that the search warrant was valid, right? This is one of our exceptions. So if the police are acting in good faith, they believe that the search warrant is valid and it is a facially valid search warrant, right? Then evidence obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment search and seizure requirement right, is still going to be admissible, even though we might have a technical, valid, a technical violation, right? Because the search warrant's actually invalid, right? Say so you have an invalid search warrant, but the police don't know that. The police think they have a valid search warrant and 100% good faith if they execute that search warrant properly and they obtain evidence, that evidence is generally going to still be admissible as long as they were operating in good faith. Just one exception to be aware of right here. But past that, right, moving on to our fourth kind of step in the analysis. If we have a government agent, right, that government agent is violating the defendant's reasonable expectation of privacy, right? We have that government agent physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area, right? Okay, next, do they have a search warrant? Is the search warrant valid, right? If they have a valid search warrant, our last question in order to be able to determine whether the search is lawful or unlawful is whether the search warrant was properly executed, right? To execute a search warrant properly, we say there's three requirements, right? The government agents conducting the search must perform the search within a reasonable amount of time from when the judge issued the warrant, they're going to have to knock and announce, and they're going to have to keep their search within the scope of the search warrant. All right, so number one, we kind of just have that timing requirement, right? If the judge issues a search warrant and the police execute that search warrant five years later, right, that's improper execution, right? It has to be a timely execution of the search warrant. Number two, they are required to knock and announce, right? The police, before they come in, right, so they're searching a home, they have a valid search warrant to, you know, search someone's home. When they get to the home, they're going to have to knock and announce. They're going to have to let the person know, hey, we're here, we're the police, we're executing a search warrant, right? They have that requirement to knock and announce. There's a few exceptions where they don't have the requirement to knock and announce. Basically, if there's danger of spoilation of evidence, right? They have a reasonable belief to know, hey, look, there's some danger of spoilation of evidence here. But for the most part, right, they do have that requirement to knock and announce. Important to recognize that that's another exception, right? If they fail to knock and announce, but everything else is done by the book, right? They have a valid search warrant and the rest of the execution of the, war of the search warrant is proper. The only reason it's improper is because of a failure to knock and announce. 
the evidence obtained during that search will still be admissible, even though technically, again, it is a violation because it's an improper execution of the search warrant. If it's solely due to a failure to knock and announce, the evidence will still be admissible, right? It's just another exception to keep in mind. But the big one here, and what we wanna look out for, something that's commonly tested on the bar exam, is that the police are going to have to keep their search within the scope of the search warrant, right? So if the search warrant says, hey, look, you can look for this, you know, sawed off shotgun, right? That's what you're looking for. We're, the item we're trying to find here is a sawed off shotgun that we believe was a murder weapon, right? In some crime, right? So the police go in, say the sawed off shotgun is like at least a foot long, right? It's gonna be a large item, right? The police aren't going to be able to go into the home and start opening tiny little, you know, jewelry box drawers, right? Say they open a little drawer, for like a jewelry box, right? A little small inch wide drawer, right? That's outside the scope of the search warrant. They're there to look for a foot long sawed off shotgun. So they can't be opening tiny little jewelry box drawers. If they do that and they find, you know, drugs in the jewelry box, right? That's outside the scope. That's an unlawful search, right? That's outside the scope of the search warrant, right? Improper execution of their search warrant, right? So that would be unlawful, right? The evidence obtained in that violation, pulling that out generally would be inadmissible because it's outside the scope of the warrant unless an exception applied, right? Which is what we'll talk about next. But again, the four steps are going to be if we're trying to determine whether a search and seizure performed, an evidentiary search and seizure performed by the government is lawful or unlawful. Number one, we have to ask under the Fourth Amendment. Number one, we have to make sure we do have a government agent involved. No government agent, Fourth Amendment's not at issue. Next, we have to make sure that it is actually a Fourth Amendment search, right? Not a search how layman's use it. We need that physical intrusion into a constitutionally protected area, a place where the defendant has a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? So do we have a government agent? Is that government agent physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area? If we have yes and yes, the next question is, okay, well, do they have a search warrant, right? Because if they don't have a search warrant, and there we have a government agent violating the defendant's reasonable expectation of privacy we know it's an unlawful search unless an exception applies if they have a search warrant we have to ask is that search warrant valid if it's an invalid search warrant we know it's an unlawful search unless an exception applies next if they have a search warrant the search warrant is valid the question is did they execute that search warrant properly right if they fail to execute the search warrant properly, we know it's an unlawful search. That search, the evidence obtained is generally going to be inadmissible unless an exception applies, right? Now, if all four of those are satisfied, then we have a by the book lawful search performed by the government, right? We have government agent physically intruding into a constitutionally protected area, but they have a valid search warrant and they executed that search warrant properly. Okay, that's a lawful search. Right, but if either of these, if three or four are not satisfied or the government agent just doesn't have a search warrant, well, we have to ask, okay, is there an exception to the search warrant requirement? Right, we know it's unlawful unless there's an exception to the search warrant requirement. Our first exception is going to be exigent circumstances. The big one here is hot pursuit. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Bar Blitz video series. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire Bar Blitz video library, which includes coverage of the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of law in each bar exam subject, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled in Studicata Bar Review. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com.